400 schools. So thank you all for coming. My name is Libby Bonesteel. For those of you who I don't know, I'm the superintendent of schools here. Um, and I'm joined, I'm going to let these fine gentlemen introduce themselves, starting with Andrew, since I forgot you last time. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Andrew LaRosa, Director of Facilities for the School District. I'm Cam Featherston Hall, Senior Associate at Truex Cullens and Project Manager for the Master Planning Project. And I'm uh, Dave Epstein, uh, one of the partners at Truex Cullens, leading, working with Cam. Cam and I do a lot of work on K-12 schools around the state and region, so glad to be here. So this is uh, kind of session two. I recognize some familiar faces from session one, which I'm psyched you came back for more. Um, the first session was setting the context for our for the, why we're doing this work and we're doing basically a facilities work plan so we have something in our hands for the future um, of our school district facilities in case uh, we need that when well, we do need that direction um, we've hired Cam and David who like they said they have a lot of experience around the state to do that work this is the session two where we're hoping to hear from you all around the vision and what you're thinking about for schooling for our children um, moving forwards and how best to use our facilities. Um, so this is gonna be a lot of your talking and us listening and, and looking at ideas that are written down um, and prioritizing a little bit. The uh, David and Cam's main responsibility is to pull that all together for us and um, into a document that we can use for future use. Um, so, with that being said, so we don't waste any more time, take it away, David. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, as Libby said, uh, this is a visioning workshop, so this is really uh, a time to put away all your practical thinking about your day today and all the stresses that um, we have, I, you know, if we had time, I'd do a centering practice um, just to get us in the right mood. But this is really a blue sky uh, opportunity to think about, like, what do we want the experience um, to be at Montpelier Schools? Um, and before I, we get into it, this is just where we are in the process. We're right at that dashed line. Um, once we're through with this, we've, we've done our information gathering, um, we've done this workshop, and then we'll start putting together sort of design options uh, for different ways the district might move forward with their planning. But this is a really critical piece of that puzzle. Um, and, and what comes out of this uh, discussion are what we call guiding principles. So the guiding principles um, talk about what are the really important qualities of the educational experience here in the district. Like, what are the things we got to get right? And what are the things, and, and cons, you know, conversely, what are the things we, we really have to avoid? But we're mostly going to focus on the positive today. And we do this through a uh, framework that we've developed called the Whole Child Framework. And the, the idea behind this is that just like the mission of our schools is to address the needs of the whole child, that should be true for the building as well, right? Because we're trying to support, as architects, we're trying to support the mission of the schools. And so what this framework allows us to do is look at the mission of, uh, the, the, mission of the school design through this whole child lens. So we've broken this into three categories, wellness, engagement, and learning. Um, you'll see that wellness is on the outside, and that provides the foundation, right? Kids have to be safe, they have to be secure, they have to be in healthy environments that are not toxic. And then the next ring is engagement. Kids have to be engaged with their community, both in the school and outside of the school. They have to feel like they're part of something. This is part of the readiness to learn. And then in the center is learning. You could call it self-discovery, right? Once you have wellness and engagement, you're ready to learn. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about 
these three categories um, and what it means in school buildings, what aspects of school design and, and the, the actual environments that we put kids in contribute to these three categories. We're gonna, ha we're gonna do them sequentially, give a, a opportunity for each table to discuss what that means for them and then report out, we'll record it on these uh, flip charts and then we'll do that three times, one for each category and then at the end, um, we'll do a little dotocracy and people will get to vote on what, because you know, we'll have, you'll have this whole laundry list of things and not everything can be the most important, right? Some things are gonna bubble up and be the really important stuff. And so we wanna hear from you what you feel that is. So um, one of the interesting things about this, you know, we developed this whole child um, framework independently and fairly recently, because we've been talking about this for years, we, we realized how closely it aligns with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Are people familiar with that at all? Yeah? So I'm here, I see some. So in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom of the period, pyramid is safety, insecurity, and physiological needs like food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. Very similar to wellness. Next, as you go up the pyramid, you have self-esteem and love and belonging. This is all this whole idea about engagement, right? In community, feeling, you know, we, we often say with middle schoolers, it's all about finding their tribe. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out who they are and, and, and you want to provide opportunities for them to feel connected. And then at the top of the pyramid, self-actualization, we're calling it learning. I mentioned we could call it self-discovery, but it was really exciting to, to as we started to um, explore the connections between both, it really reinforced uh, the validity of the whole child framework. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about wellness and talking about ways schools can create healthy environments. And then we're gonna give you folks 10 to 15 minutes to kind of brainstorm what that means for you and what, what you feel is important about some of the wellness uh, aspects that we're looking at for Montpelier schools. So let's get started. So location and access, walkability, you know, and that's, that's a, we've heard several times in the context workshop that we did how important that was to folks in Montpelier that kids have schools they can walk to because that's the experience now. Sometimes we're, we're working in, you know, schools that are in suburban locations, rural locations, um, and it's not as applicable. Uh, but, you know, with the whole obesity up epidemic in this country, you know, one of the things that has been cited is that, like, kids just don't walk to school anymore. They used to walk to school all the time. Now we've got these centralized schools. It means getting on a bus, getting in a car. Um, Another aspect, this isn't really facility related, but like my wife was a school-based clinician. She used to say, if I could just get the kids to get a good night's sleep, I would be 50% of my way of my job would be done. Um, so start times to schools can have a big effect. You know, I, some, school, some school districts have pushed high school start times later because that's what teenagers need. Um, others haven't because they need to go to their after school jobs. Um, light, this is a huge one in terms of um, wellness um, and learning. There's been studies that show um, that learning, um, there's a famous PPG study that with double blind study that shows that kids who have access to natural light learn, uh, have more effective learning. Two, two, two groups, same conditions, uh, same subject matters taught. The kids who have access to natural light um, are, have a higher level of achievement and learning. And it's not just natural light, too. It's the quality of the artificial light. Um, one of the exciting things now is um, tunable spectrum lighting. Has anybody heard about that? So with the architect has heard of it, of course. Um, basically, with LEDs, you can get 
your, your artificial lighting system to mimic the pattern of the sun. And it really helps with uh, circadian rhythms and with, because it's a natural cycle. The sun starts off very bright in the mornings, right? And then it gets yellower and yellower. And you can actually pattern the lighting in the school, any building, to, to match that. This is a, a shot of the Winooski School's uh, lobby. And you can see how much natural light is coming down from the skylights and how it's uh, balanced with the artificial light. Um, obviously, we're talking about all these basic needs, light, water, air, food, uh, healthy, fresh, um, local. Um, a lot of schools have um, farm to school programs. I, I don't know, do you have one here, farm to school program? or We don't, technically, Te no. Technically. Yeah. Um, Movement, not just, uh, you know, classic athletic fields, um, playgrounds, but climbing walls, gardeners, um, personal fitness, yoga, movement. You know, one of the things that you'll see in a lot of these schools built in this era and, and older is they, they, they address athletics and playgrounds and they address academics, but they don't really deal with the social-emotional piece. And we'll, we'll talk about that as a common theme as we go through this. Um, so we talked about natural light. Fresh air ventilation is another uh, huge factor with wellness, and that obviously has become much more um, to the forefront with COVID. Um, you know, non-toxic materials and cleaning methods. Um, and this one has really come to the forefront as both humidity control and uh, climate control. Um, with global warming, um, it's getting hotter and hotter. These buildings are poorly insulated, a lot of our schools. They're incredibly uncomfortable. Um, more and more, we're seeing air conditioning as N not even just a discussion, but a requirement, because uh, and the best analogy I've heard is um, somebody said, you know how artificial turf extends the athletic season? They said, well, air conditioning extends the learning season. And we were talking with folks Winooski, they're saying we're getting two weeks of more learning time on either end of the schedule. And that, that's a significant proportion. And, and of course, this is a huge one these days, unfortunately, but safety and security. Um, and you know, the real challenge is, we know we can make buildings more secure, but how do we make them welcoming um, and secure? Uh, this was a project at Mount Abe where we renovated the lobby and we, we put in this glass vestibule and the transaction window, um, all the glass. It's not bulletproof, it, but it is, has blast protection and it's got film on it. Um, so it's, it's equivalent of laminated glass. Um, but you know, there's the, the, the hardening of our buildings um, when at the same time we're talking about engagement and making buildings welcoming and kids feeling like they're connected, there, there's definite tension there. Um, this is, once again, this isn't really school design, but it's related, is what are the ideal groupings of ages that are developmentally appropriate? Huge, we have conversations all the time with schools about middle school. Is it six, seven, eight? Is it seven, eight? Is it five, six, seven, eight? You could, you could, get, you could get this room full of middle school educators and, and no, you, could, you, you might get a, you'd have a very robust discussion about what's the right grouping. Um, and sometimes, um, so anyway, does, this is something to think about with wellness, what's the, what's the and, and engagement, it's really, and, and I will say that a lot of these categories, a lot of these, sub, these little mini topics, you could put in any one of the three uh, 
buckets of the framework. So now we're going to turn it over to you. There's a piece of paper and a pen on each table. And um, you can, what we'd like you to do is take about 10, 15 minutes and talk about these different things in terms of wellness and what's really important in your minds for Montpelier School, Montpelier Roxbury Schools. And then what we're going to do is come back together and somebody from your team should be your spokesman and report out and Cam's going to report it, record it on the, uh, the paper and um, should be really interesting. So we'll give you about 10, 15 minutes and then we'll come back together. So. Let, and let me know if you have any questions. Just raise your hand. Do you want to be the writer? Can you write? Well, I can't spell. Unless you want to do it. No, it's okay. Uh -huh. MRPS students no. and how can MRPS facilities right. best support these goals? So why do we do them one at a time? Hmm. I think walkability is huge for me. You know, we've talked to neighbors and stuff, and a lot of folks. And it's it's Montpelier. It doesn't include Roxbury, but I've got a related comment for Roxbury. And uh, a lot of us moved here because we wanted to live in a walkable community and have our kids be able to walk to school. And having grown up in a rural community like Roxbury and been bused to uh, a school. I never had that opportunity, and I've seen the independence that my son's been able to gain far earlier than I did. I just I see the benefits of that, so I think walkability is key. And then with the Roxbury piece in mind, as a kid who was bus from a rural school who went 20 minutes one way and an hour the other on the yeah. bus loop to get back, the benefit I got from that for setting me up for being able to get to a good college and life was was huge. So I, I want that for those Roxbury kids and. You gotta have a sports bus in my mind. There's gotta be what I just put as a timely transit for the rural school. Yeah. Because if I hadn't been able to do sports, I don't know where I'd be today. But it was key for me to stay interested in my academics to do sports. Because you can't do sports if you're not doing well in your academics. And so for a lot of kids, I think for them to be an engaged learner, sometimes it's carried out you get to play football, you get to run track, you get to do whatever. So, so like so like transportation that ensures equitable access. Equitable access. Yeah. Because yeah. like, if you were a Roxbury kid but you always had to go home at three yeah. and everybody else was staying and doing sports, yeah. that would not make you feel equal. Yeah. Yep. I, I like that framing the transportation because folks that are maybe not, it's not walkable to live. You know, if you live right. on River Street, the far end, yeah. you're yeah. not necessarily walking. You might be biking. You might be right. t having some other mode of transportation. But just the accessible, the accessibility, and then the equitable access to transportation. I think. So we're <coughs> reframing that from walkability to accessibility and connectivity through transportation. Because sure. the bikeability was a great idea too. I hadn't thought about. Cause yeah. I'm, Thinking yeah. of my mindset right now, so yeah. I appreciate that. Well, I think part of, part of that too is also the lo location. Like, if this site's abandoned because of the fl you know the flood, why? Well, just get some stilts. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like what's that? It's Mont Saint Michel in France that you can only get to it by yeah, that's right. By, by high the tide. Wind low tide. Wind low tide. We'll be the Mont Saint Michel. <laughs> <laughs> but but where where it's located? Like if it, you know the. The golf course would be a, a, it's a beautiful site, but it's a really challenging for, for a lot of kids yeah. to get, you know, a lot of kids to get there. Um, so, like, integration with the community is, I think, is also really important. Right. And, then, you know, if, if it, um, you know, contingent with that, I guess, is uh, thinking about, like, what, you know, what grades are located where, like, the one, the, you know, the, the, Elementary school and the middle school are kind of really great. That's more residential. The elementary is like kind of close to business, but it feels it's facing the residential. But the high school, I know, I know a lot of kids do the outward. Well, I forget what the name is. Where the outward and engage with the community, community right. learning, like an internship. Yeah, sort of thing. and if it, so, if it was more like located, you know, if you can imagine, a, I mean, I don't know how this would happen, but a, a connection with or the business environment or ways for it to integrate with that so it's walkable 
but also like easy connection to that those like you know the outside yeah. learning yeah. integrated with the community like yeah that sort of locked in for me um, I, I think we are now on our second question like, I want to bring us back to what are the yeah, actual goals because yeah. I don't think a goal is walkability or integration with the community I think that's how a facility could achieve a goal so what are the actual what's the what's the why behind the integration of the community is, that has I, to do with wellness why is that not a not a goal because I think it's how you achieve the goal so well what what is what's the so value the of the integration, integration with the, what does yeah, it get integration us integration with community if we back that up to what is the value yeah what does right? it get us so it's a it's, I think what I think I'm hearing is that in Montpelier, what we value is that our schools are like, have a sense of place within their community, right? Like our kids, and, and in Roxbury as well, our kids, where they go to school, feels very much like a part of the community and vice versa. Right, right? Yeah, they're right? connected to place, like you said. Yeah. yeah. Mm, right. Okay. That's some serious I just speak there. Sorry, guys. No, but <laughs> it, was, it was evident from the recent school board meeting about the connection from Roxbury yeah. for place. Like, that was yeah. the school and Roxbury are one. Yeah. They are integrated, and the separation of one from the other would yeah. be devastating for them. But yeah. I think, I think Montpelier we definitely is similar. See that in Montpelier. I'm, I'm with you. Like, when we were deciding where to live in Vermont. Yeah. This was like one of my number one criteria. Yeah, we. I I grew up walking across the street to school in Cabot, and so it was really it was really easy. And we moved here three years ago for the same exact same reason. It's worked out phenomenally. Right. Yeah, exactly. You guys, you guys, this is a good conversation, but you should make sure you, you know, take put a, put a lot of it down. Yeah, yeah. And think about what your mm -hmm. uh, think about what your top items are going to be. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if someone else takes one of your top items, put one of the top items. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea too of um, maybe uh, kids being able to be here later because. Um, I think there are, I worked in the schools, not the school, and mm -hmm. there, there were a lot of issues around kids who really didn't have any food at home, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. so having stuff available later, mm -hmm. like some kind of healthy, substantial yeah. snack with mm -hmm. a place to be, and, yeah. um, I mean, there were kids who would, at breakfast, would take a day's worth of food and stuff in their pockets so they would have something to eat the rest yeah, of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think that's necessarily not here. I don't think there, you know, we, we certainly have students who are living in hotels who are... Right. Mm -hmm. But they don't come to school saying, hey, I don't have anything to eat. I mean, they're so, you know, they want to want to look different. And oh, right. No, they're, they're not going to be public about that. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the dignity piece is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, the, the goals are obviously sort of being able to, you know, there's educational goals, but then also just like that sort of base, you know, like... Foundation of safety. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the safety, the security, the, the food, the culture. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like that is obviously one goal. I mean, it seems like, you know, obviously with Montpelier, I think it's statewide, too, it's like the, the free lunches. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, so that's that's a step in the right direction. But yeah, it's providing those sort of foundational needs. <clears throat> um, you know, I don't know how like they would go over at town meeting day when it's like we're going to have a dental clinic in the school, but you know. But you know, we'd be able to if we had a space for it, we yeah. might be able to convince a doctor's office to put a PA here, and you might be able to convince a dentist's office to put a dental hygienist in here yeah. twice yeah. a week or once a yeah. week, or, you know, if we could set up a facility so they just had to send the body over, yeah. and they would do all the billing and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever yeah. happened with that. Yeah, totally. And would that extend, would that, would we, would that extend to families? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I'm just asking, because I think there's this uh, it's like a dune and the edges of it you know where do we yeah from there on Drop we're not responsible the sand. right yeah. You know, or, or yes we if, you know time and space permitting 
not sure. Just because it's top of mind. Exactly. I mean, it's the kind of thing, too, where it's like, you know, if we did provide it for not just the students, but also the families, and that would then further, like, boost those family members up that sort of, like, pyramid and then be able to provide more for their children. Well, we can start with the kids anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It kind of keeps like, it's like the onion peels, and like you start at the core of the children in right. school, and then you get further out, and eventually it's like all of the town and the culture and right. the things that are. And obviously, there. if I'm in Libby's shoes, it was helpful to have some parameters around which population I'm responsible for and which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she walked over when she did. Even though sometimes <laughs> yeah. evil, right? <laughs> I, 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 doctor, eye doctor, eyes, optician, dentist, just medical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we didn't nail it all. I mean, I, I think. All right. Well, yeah. moving forward. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, okay. All right. This, this table here is going to go first. And then we'll do that table and then that table. Want to turn the lights on for this? Uh, I don't know. The people. There we go. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. See what I wrote. Uh, so what? So a few things came up for us. Um, the first, um, looking for spaces that are conducive to learning and movement um, together. Um, and I think a thing that came up for us was flexibility of space. Um, the example of you know, kind of the elementary school classroom where you've got small tables, kids can move around um, depending on what's happening in the classroom. Um, second thing was kind of more integration of outside into the inside. Um, connection to nature, I think, is the theme we're looking at there. Um, how do you bring in more vegetation? How do you bring in more natural light um, to, I guess, kind of um, infuse the space with more of a natural kind of feeling? Um, and then a, a, another idea that came out of that was just are there, are there different in, in, or inexpensive structures, a greenhouse, for example, um, that allow for learning that's closer to the outdoor environment? Um, we talked a lot about um, kind of travel to from schools and, and how you might stagger or delay start times depending on age, depending on kind of family schedule. Um, that one's a little bit less defined, but how does that, I think, contribute to overall wellness of students um, when, how they're arriving? Um, yeah, because we're supposed to be getting people's top three. Top no, three. Okay, we only have one more. No, they can Top four. Go ahead. Come on. Don't All right. Yeah. Um, this is our this is our last one. Then others can go. Um, um, last thing that came up was just maybe different different types of spaces, different scales of spaces um, that accommodate sometimes individual, um, more solitary kinds of things like mindfulness reflection versus others that are more group or collaborative um, focused. Uh, we, you did, we talked about a number of different ideas, one of which was could the, could the school be a site for uh, medical, dental, optometrist, you know, uh, let us not assume that everyone's getting those services elsewhere, and if it's a, even if it's on a, an occasional basis, could the school be a site for that and a partner with or with multiple community providers in that area. Um, these are not in a, in a ranked order. Uh, the school is being a safe place to gather at many hours. So especially if we're, if we're willing to accept shifting starting times to later based on the crazy circadian rhythms of our teenagers, you know, would it also be nice for them to have a place where they can gather together, connect and create community um, in only safe ways? Um, <laughs> later in the day, uh, you know, for some kids, they may not they may not have a place to go during the day that's supervised. They may not feel safe. Who knows what? Uh, obvious um, 
serving basic needs like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, acknowledging that nutrition is not um, universally secure for our community. And I, I wrote to myself, we didn't talk about this, but you know, providing food through the summer as well would be a wish of mine. And then the first topic that came up was mental health and talking about the contributing factors and walkability as a walkability of the schools in our community for many students being a sort of built in um, sort of counter to the issues of nutrition, fitness, et cetera, in the US. Um, and then a, a nod to sort of fitness broadly broadly conceived, not, not simply athletics, which you already brought up. Um, so we didn't really talk about that facilities. What did we talk about? Yeah, so. Mental health was, I don't know if you got that on there. You said it, but I. Yeah, thank you. Do you want us to say stuff that's already been said? Should we still put it out there? Yeah, I'll put a check mark. Okay. Um, really broadly, some goals that we named are that our schools feel connected to the community and vice versa, that the community feels connected to the schools, that there is a connection for our learners to the outdoors. Um, we didn't get into specifics, except we talked more about constructing outdoor classrooms and less about bringing the outdoors in. That was more of our focus. Um, that all types of learners, whether they're have, they have mental health challenges or socioeconomic challenges or neurodiversity, can access both the community of school and the learning that takes place in school. And that there is healthy uh, local food, access to lo healthy local food. Those were the big goals we had. And then we named a few of the hows would be connectivity through transportation, connectivity and accessibility through transportation, and that the um, buildings themselves are integrated with the community. So when you talk about buildings integrated with the community, does that mean, um, could you talk a little bit about what you meant to me by that? Well, the, the first thing that came up that I don't think will be a surprise is, is walkability. That was a, like a, the very, very first thing that we all said. So yeah. um, whether that's in Roxbury or Montpelier, walkability, bikeability. Um, but also the sense of like if you have high schools doing um, like community-based and service learning, can they access the community uh, easily? Um, and then also some of those ideas about like how does the community use the building as a resource and vice versa? There's a, a bullet I didn't catch, it was the second to last one. Um, connectivity and accessibility through transportation. That really gets you your walkability, bikeability, and then for Roxbury, timely bus services so that right. folks can right. come here and not just do school and go back, but interact in extra curriculars, school, clubs, theater, that kind of thing. My apologies, can you repeat yourself one more time? No problem. Connectivity and accessibility through transportation. Connectivity and accessibility, accessibility through transportation. Yeah. We're going to put it on a bumper sticker. It was too many syllables. It's going to be an awful lot of syllables. We'll come up with an acronym. Because that will help. Because that will help. So now we want to talk about engagement, um, helping students feel connected to their school, to, to groups within their school, to the community and the world. Um, you know, there's, this, this has a multiple scales to it because sometimes in larger schools we're trying to create schools within schools. You know, we're trying to create smaller communities. Um, a very good example is middle school, which is try, you know, has usually teams concept is this team-based approach and you're trying to take the sense of community in the team um, so here we go you know the different 
<coughs> so in Vermont, you know, we talk about, well, in general, we talk about small schools, but in Vermont, it's a little bit of a misnomer because we have micro schools and small schools. We don't really have, lar there's very few large schools, you know, maybe Shelburne, Milton, there's a couple of big ones, but, you know, I always try to point out that when people talk about the benefits of small schools, they're not talking about 35 kids or 50 kids because there's almost no benefit to school that small other than you're maintaining maybe your local community school. Um, you're really talking about schools that are, you know, more like 150 is considered a small school. Um, we did a study for Addison Central but what's the ideal elementary school size? Because they were like, we desperately want to have a full-time nurse, a full-time librarian. You know, it's two sections per grade. It's actually more like 250. You know, it's, it's a big, that, for them, when they talked about how you'd staff a school and how you deliver a robust set of programs, of course, they have, they only have one school in there in Addison Central, that size, which is Mary Hogan, which is bigger than that, all the other schools are, the micro schools. So, um, but when you get these big schools, you often try to do schools within schools. Sometimes they're called cores, houses. Um, you can consider academies, which are like theme-based um, groups, um, teams, uh, all these different uh, social spaces help create community, a sense of community, um, and you know. Like when we did Winooski and other schools we worked on, there's a lot of discussion about like, well, should we have two entrances, one for buses, one for um, one for drop off, one for you know walkers? And the answer was no, because from a security standpoint, you really'd like to have everybody coming in the same entry. But it also helps create a sense of community when all ages, all staff are coming through the same door and mixing in a lobby, having a chance to say hi. Um, and so how you design a building can really encourage um, that. This was a school we did in a um, place in Sofia, Bulgaria, and we created this really wonderful amphitheater, which has a lot of historical precedent in Bulgaria, because there's a lot of, uh, there's Roman amphitheaters everywhere, believe it or not, in Bulgaria. Um, and they do a lot, so this was a place for them to gather outdoors. Um, another way, you can increase engagement is through engaging design. Design that speaks to kids. You know, we often talk about buildings, um, buildings speak, and what do they say about, like if you were to drive up to this building, and what, what is this building saying to people uh, in terms of its iconography? Um, is it saying, come on in, there's a vibrant learning community inside? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, this was a, early learning center in Heinsberg, and you can see the colors are very age appropriate. The lighting is a little bit of playfulness to it. This is what connects kids to their environment, and that's how a build, one of the ways a building can help kids feel connected to community, because they walk in and they say, this is my place. Uh, transparency is another great way, um, like for example, the library, when you walk by, you get a, get a little bit of an inkling here of what's going on, but you know, we're often trying to get libraries closer to the entrance with more glass, because so, they're, they're really exciting spaces with all the different learning that's going on and the books. Um, and so you can create, uh, you can also, you can enhance the sense of engagement with learning through transparency. Um, another way, a building can connect. Um, now we're, we're talking about a little bit a different community, as in the environment. How do kids feel connected um, to their world through the environmental stewardship of the building? You know, when you create a building that's uh, really firing on all cylinders in terms of its sustainable practices through these materials, you, you know, recycled rainwater. Uh, renewable energy. This is a this is a picture of a project that has all that going on. You can actually create buildings that teach. You know, the building itself becomes a pedagogical tool. Um, you can have 
dashboards. You can use it for science experiments. How much energy did we produce today? Um, and it really starts to model, you know, we teach environmental stewardship in schools, and now the building is a chance to model that. And we all know as parents, it's not what we say that our kids learn from, it's what we do and how we act in the world. And, and I think this is, is uh, a, a real opportunity. Uh, this is one that, as I was saying, some of these fall into multiple categories, but um, not just uh, where does the food come from, but using food as an opportunity to teach. Um, we're, we're more and more trying to incorporate teaching kitchens into schools so that, you know, if you're doing a unit on uh, another country, if you're doing a unit on measurement, you can use food as a vehicle to teach. And once again, it connects kids back to their environment. Where does their food come from, right? How, how does these things that we eat, how are they made? Um, all in more opportunities to engage and learn. Um, we talked about this last, uh, when we were reporting out about community accessibility. Uh, this is a new lobby renovation at Mount A. I don't know if anybody's seen it before, but I, I wish I had the before picture because it's quite a transformation. But, um, you know, does your school have an event entry so that you can, you know, the public feels welcome and but they can't wander through the building? Um, do you have meeting rooms that the public can use uh, or conferencing ability? Um, even incorporating works of local artists or showcasing um, students. You know, when we walked into this lobby, the very first, the only thing that was in the lobby were sports trophies. I said to them, I said, you know, if I didn't know better, I would think all this building is about, all the school's about is sports. That's all you really care about. And they're like, no, 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 we have a really vibrant performing arts program. We have, you know, all this great stuff going. I said, well, you know, now's the opportunity when we renovate the lobby to make that manifest because what, what people experience when they walk in a building speaks volumes about what that school values. And so when you walk into any one of the schools in this district, Think about what do you see and, and what, how does it reflect on the community. So we're going to do our, another breakout session. And so one of the prompts is what kind of school communities are you trying to nurture in the district? Is it at the grade team level? Is it at the school level? Um, is it the entire district? Is that important that it feels like a community? Um, because some, so, you know, we work in, in a lot of districts where it's really fascinating. You know, they merge the districts, and but there's no sense of community. The communities are the towns. The district is not a community, and so they they try to think about the district as if it was one. And you know, at Harwood right now, the superintendent, the new superintendent, I think he's really on something. And we're going to every town to talk about the project. We're not trying to have like big like, we're going to have one meeting for the whole district because it doesn't work that way there. Every town is a unique community. So that's one, one of the questions. The other one is, you know, this environmental leadership piece is a really important, um, I think, question to, 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 for us to understand from you folks. What, where should this district be? Is it a, is it, we're gonna do the best we can, we're gonna do what we can afford, or do we wanna be leaders when it comes to sustainability and environmental design? And finally, this is, this is a fun one, if you have time, think about it, and it goes back to what I was saying. If your buildings could speak, what, sh what should it say? What should they say about your school culture? So, we'll give you guys 10 to 15 minutes once again, and then we'll report back out, and then we'll wrap up with the learning uh, component of the, of the program. <laughs> oh, boy.
Well, the thing that comes up for me in the first one, what kinds of school communities? I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in Which one, what are you the talking? first bullet point, what kinds of school communities are you trying to nurture? One thing I'm really interested in is kids or organizing their own communities, their own groups based on their interests, their passions. Um, it's kind of like it just emerges from whatever kids are interested in and, and care about, really. So it's, I guess in some way it's like how kids start clubs at the school. Um, but so one thing that this district lacks is after school care, <clears throat> which is a great opportunity for those is a great place for those opportunities to emerge. Mm -hmm. And that's not a value of this district. No? No. Really? Huh. I don't know, I don't have kids in school. You probably do, right? Mm -hmm. You do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kids, there, there my are, kids are having kids in school. Are, there are <laughs> limited spaces and they're not. <laughs> I think many folks want to participate and are, don't get a space. And then for those who do, there are I don't know if there are subsidies or not. I think they're hard to come by, so the expense is significant and uh, prohibitive. Okay. So is this primarily a, a space issue, as, or is it's it a, a value staffing? issue? Okay. Got it. I mean, I'm from Roxbury. Okay. Got it. And uh, we, but it, it, after school has always been essential because it's extremely working class. People yeah. are working, working, yeah. working. There's a lot of folks here that aren't working quite as much or doing different things mm -hmm. or have more flexibility. I don't know exactly what the makeup is, but yeah. folks can't not work in Roxbury. Got it. But it's it's we've been surprised to learn that it's not particularly yeah. strongly valued. Okay. Huh. A lot of talk, but no action, right? <laughs> There's a lot of talk about equity too. Yeah. yeah. Support for a lot of talk for black families. Yeah, that's a that's that's a good one. Equity. Because that's I mean that came up for me. Um, about like what should our buildings say about our school culture and equity for me I mean the first place I went was class diversity so how do we create a welcoming space that does accommodate a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds I also think about that kind of equity in terms of you know, uh, racial background, racial identity. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of work being done on that, right? But can the can our spaces and the things that we offer in our spaces, like you were just saying, the after school care, can it really like facilitate that? Yeah. I mean, I love the idea of there being. Um, spaces for events that are closed from the rest of the building so that people don't just have the free range mm -hmm. of the building and then the idea of spaces being available to the public for whatever maybe it's your clay mm -hmm. group or you know and those being integrated between adults and kids you yeah. know it could be that what the kids are interested yeah. maybe kids are into some kind of game or whatever that you know, Dungeons and Dragons that there are mm -hmm. adults totally into, you know what right. I mean? And, and, that, and there could be some cross generational, yeah. uh, you know, integration as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything coming up for you, Tom? Yeah. 
no, no, this is a tough one for me yeah. this one, I guess. I don't know what a school is supposed to say. <laughs> it should say, welcome without big dollar signs. Welcome without big dollar signs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? You must be thinking of tax implications. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Inviting without. Well, there's got to be something. You know. Yeah. Well, that's an equity issue that we've just been talking about here, right? The 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 ramifications of taxation hit people differently depending on what their yeah. income level is. Yeah. And the capacity for this kind of development too. It's like cost money to mm -hmm. renovate, mm -hmm. not oh, just no. not just rebuild, mm -hmm. but even to mm -hmm. even to provide general maintenance yeah. is cost real money. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, maintenance <clears throat> definitely. Yeah. I mean, the, the question is like, you know, I think there are places that don't want to spend money on education. And there's less available. Mm -hmm. It's it's more bare bones. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they are just about their sports team. Maybe not even that because they can't support them. You know what I mean? Because they don't want to spend the money to support them. And then there are spaces. There are places that value all the pieces. You know that that make a kid. You know, feel safe, feel welcome, feel like they belong, and that does cost money. Yep. You know, uh, and there's no way around the costs. It's it's a tough. Right. One. It's, it's I know. hard. It's, yeah. it's always yeah. it's, this I, I, is I the hear you. it's Boy, tough it's, one. I don't so know hard. what uh, it was on Channel Three News. I saw it a couple times that they're saying that we're looking at 18 percent property tax increase for the schools. 18%. That's, uh, so it's ca if, as long as... I don't know how, it, how it, <coughs> they're thinking of why or what. what right. So as long as not, the yeah. per spending per... I mean, I'm on the school board. Yeah. So as long as per pending, per, the spending per pupil doesn't increase by 10%, um, the tax increase will be capped at 5%. Mm -hmm. So if we vote, no, the, I mean the school board, whatever, but we're doing so that. So it won't be 18%. Yeah. Certainly not this budget cycle. No. It better not. <laughs> no, that would be. And I think that the reason why that letter went out was because the, the ramifications of recent changes in laws turned out to be pretty harmful, mm -hmm. more so than anyone expected. I think there was great intention and it turned out to have a, a big a big impact. That for the for this budget cycle, the real hit to families can be avoided, but potentially mm -hmm. if something's not done to make adjustments in the law that just change the way that we fund our schools, right. then it, it could become a big a big increase and not not even because there's any new additions. You know, it's not like spending is increased. It's just the lot. funding it's mechanism just, yeah, changes. Just the funding mechanism changes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Although, I will say we did give a pretty good raise to teachers mm -hmm. following the pandemic mm -hmm. and in response to the, the inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, as yeah. a, I, I, I stand by that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's absolutely. That wasn't the main reason why numbers went up. There's mm -hmm. there's more reasons. There's also health care costs. Mm -hmm. The governor made it so that individual districts couldn't negotiate as individual districts. It's a the whole statewide thing, and they just are getting screwed. Right. Right. <laughs> health care costs have gone up a lot. Yeah. So it's it's also complicated. Yeah, it's, it's nauseating. <laughs> But there's some good stuff on there. I mean, I like it. It does all kind of seem to come out of this equity value. Um, so I like I like these issues. What about the environmental leadership piece? Um, I'm I'm torn on that one. Which one? Environmental the second stewardship. Board, like how oh. environmental leadership. Because I, I, I know and feel the crisis of our changing climate, but does that mean that we're, a, we're our small community and our school is leading 
the movement to address these really systems level issues. I mean, I think we should be we should be proceeding with net zero in mind, right? Well, they're, they're already got that plan. They've got so many well, other things it's, planned. It's, I mean, it's just, kind of you a, know what? Just kind of I think it's a goal, right? Right, right. But you yeah. know what? I think. Just hold the pace you're at. You don't have to jump up any higher. Just try to go a little, you know, what you're thinking of and at a good slow pace because I mean, I think you, you don't want to be putting out too much and then you don't have, you're not going to be able to reach her and just slow and steady and then try to get results and see what the truth is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, over, say, 10, 15 years, See, you know, because they're saying even Vermont isn't reaching their goals, and yeah. we're spending lots and lots of money on this. So it's just slow and steady, you know, and see what happens within 10, 15 years, you know. And then if it isn't, then maybe there's somewhere else you can adjust. But if you just keep throwing out all these things, it just gets harder and harder and more and more expensive. Well, there's something too that I appreciate, which is, you know, as as new technology becomes more mainstream, the cost of it goes down. I mean, look at solar, right? Mm -hmm. the cost of solar has come down like crazy, um, and so we should be incorporating those practices, methods into our facilities. But I, I think I agree I with you. I, yeah, I don't think we can be on the bleeding edge. As they no. come before, more affordable, yeah. as we can fit them into yeah. reasonable yeah. budgets. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to... Uh, yeah. You know, what were uh, solar panels like just 10 years ago compared to today? I mean, you know, it's a lot... You know, now, you know, you do have a lot of fields full, full of uh, solar panels. Ten years from now, it could be one solar panel to get all the freaking yeah. energy that you're doing. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. try just at a good, steady, realistic pace. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you keep throwing in all these other so much. It's just like get it <laughs> for me mm -hmm. yeah, I just no, get so I mean, frustrated you can only handle yeah. Like, like, yeah. You, can, you can be idealistic you just can't suddenly fly yeah. you know what <laughs> thank I mean? you <laughs> <laughs> that's the way you gotta put it yes <laughs> I love that one <laughs> thank you okay, who wants to report out from this okay <laughs> Story of my life, Joe. <laughs> um, well, there was a lot of excitement at our table for uh, answering question number three first. Okay. So um, we want the buildings to reflect the different stages of life our learners are in. We want the buildings to, to convey that learning is exciting and dynamic. I will slow down. Luckily, it's all recorded, so. Yeah, yeah right. Thanks for the reminder. I have to make sure that I swear. Not that I would do that today. Take that out. So, age appropriate design. Age appropriate, yeah. So, yeah, and if I can. So, Dave, I swear I'm not being paid by Truex Collins. I just am yeah. a big admirer of what you guys did in Winooski. And the example that I gave was Winooski is a pre K through 12 school. But when you're in the building, when you're in the different schools within the school, it very much reflects that age. So when you're over in the high school section, I felt like it felt like a community college campus. There was lots of spaces where students, older students, can make their own decision about where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing, and it's not directed by the school, right? It's not like this is a meeting space. It's like oh, there's this big area with these kind of giant stairs that very, it, I mean, I was a community college kid. It very much reminded me yeah. of where I went to school. And then when you're over in the elementary school, it feels cozy and it felt like an elementary school in that very nurturing environment. And the, you also did that with color, which was great as well. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I swear I'm not being paid by Travis Collins, but that was something <laughs> that really stood out to me and I would love to see that in our buildings as well. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. So there, there were a couple more on what we want the school to say, which is that you are welcome here. 
and the U is anybody. Um, and that we want the school to foster curiosity among our learners and staff. Um, we I missed that last foster. Oh, foster curiosity. <clears throat> We think the general consensus in our community is that we would like to see MRPS be um, an environmental leader. And some ideas that we have are, um, or just sort of to back that up, are the need for resiliency of our buildings. Um, buildings can, in the way that we um, design or, uh, or redesign them, can, can help reinforce and teach that environmental leadership and reflect that value. And then there are a few other specifics that I, this one we got a lot talking at the well, same time. So I couldn't You pointed get out them that all. this is a priority for our students. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. our so students like, yeah. have I think been generally speaking in our about community, this. but very specifically our community, or our students have said this is a priority for them. What, what's a priority? Uh, environmental leadership. Environmental leadership. Environmental leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any other specifics? Yeah, no, I, I think you named it. Yeah, I, we, we, I think maybe it's reiterating what you said, how, how build, the buildings can be, um, can be, can talk about that and be didactic tools for that, you, not just anything new, but the existing buildings mm -hmm. at the same time. Right, right. Our ex and then um, to answer the community question, it comes back to a little, um, one thing we think is important to foster is that sort of teaming approach based on what um, sort of, not just grade level, but kind of um, stage of life mm -hmm. um, our learners are at. Um, we want the buildings to foster a, like a whole community within them that also um, supports all needs. Do you want to give your example of how like big and? <laughs> sure, like, I, you know, I have one kid who would love to be in a huge space with lots of people. Sure. And I have other kids who would would hate you know that would be terrifying yeah, for right. them they want they need a smaller space mm -hmm. yeah. to congregate in um, and then just to specifically answer what kind of community are we trying to nurture yeah. um, we do believe it's really important and valuable to nurture our district as a community and we acknowledge we're not there yet thinking of our entire district as a whole community you think right now it's kind of school centric like middle school or is it Montpelier and Roxbury? I think there's a lot of school, the schools do a lot to foster community and pride within their schools. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. each school has their own actual mascot, like literal yeah, yeah. person puts on a costume. So yeah, yeah. there is definitely that happening. And I do believe that there's a Roxbury community and a Montpelier community, and we could do better to have a whole community. Okay, how about this table? Uh, uh, so. We, we don't, we, I would say maybe don't have a consensus about the sort of uh, age cohorts uh, as they are. We explored a little bit your idea that if you, I think, which is sort of an economic lens, like if you want to be able to afford a full-time nurse, you need 250 kids. You know, so, okay, what's that? Are we going to choose age group or, or um, grade level cohorts based on finding that sweet spot of numbers? Probably not. But anyway, um, uh, we had a wonderful idea about uh, a community of highly kinetic kids and sort of embracing kids as they are, which I think dovetails or, or is piggybacking on what you just articulated. You know, some, some kids really need to learn and be active and others maybe not. Right. And then my own editorial on that would be, and maybe we need to mix them sometimes so that they all learn some from the other. Five spaces for both. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we, can, we, can we just, can we drill down a little bit more? Because I'm not exactly sure how to notate what you said. Uh, so, so this this is too reductive, but yeah, highly kinetic kids, and then maybe there's a continuum of. This is so dangerous. Quiet and cerebral, is the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fully stepped in it. So I'm going to trust that you take the spirit of that and not the uh, precise language, right? Because because that's, uh, the generalization does no justice to. How dynamic yeah, kids are. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I didn't say couch no, potatoes. It, it's about addressing, you know, different different modes of learning, mm -hmm. being and being. Yeah. And, and how how does the school um, accommodate both 
people who need quiet, deep, immersive time and social, active time. Some some kids need both, and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some kids need more of one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, providing that kind of range of spaces. Um, we talked about, you know, the pointing towards an ideal of a living building where uh, the building does reinforce environmental, you know, stewardship and, and those values, acknowledging that that's a, that, that specific designation is probably aspirational, but moving closer towards that is, is helpful. When you say living building, is there, is there a context? We're like the living building challenge, you know, as sort of the, the high standard of yeah, yeah. <laughs> goals. Yeah, that is a, when people say living building, are you living yeah. in our Not necessarily so like, you know, organically alive walls, but just that. No, 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 yeah, we're familiar yeah, with yeah. the Food Futures Institute. It's, that's a very, very high bar. Yeah. We'd love to hear that. It would be amazing. Very high bar. <laughs> the, um, you know, kitchens, kitchens that are able to cook creative, healthy meals, uh, And then in, in this sort of, through the lens of if a building could talk, what do we wish it would say? Uh, I'm not sure we, I'm not sure we took that quite verbatim, but we wish for the buildings in our district to promote the idea of global citizenship, right? That, that uh, students are not just products who will become part of an economic output, but um, citizens of their community, citizens of the world, Am I capturing that? Yeah, just the broader ecological everything. <laughs> we all had a lot of excitement about our buildings being uh, meeting, meeting places for many things, you know, more than just school concerts in the school auditorium, more than, more than just school meetings in a school library, for example. Um, uh, you know, definitely wishing for inviting entrances to the buildings. Um, and then, the, uh, well, uh, the idea of, of the district buildings being resources, resource centers in a crisis. You know, could you, do we have solar panels and batteries and, and therefore no matter what happens, you can come charge your phone or uh, we can provide food at a, you know, to the community or we can provide shelter to the community. Uh, resource, uh, our, our facilities can be resource, community resources in a crisis. I would say, I would say community resource centers in a crisis because emerge, I think there are many things that are crises that are not emergencies. <laughs> I'm here splitting hairs. Would you like to see the two halves? <laughs> And I wrote accessible because I don't think we've heard that yet, and we didn't actually talk about that. But you, somebody said you talked about I don't know your name, Joe. Joe probably do know your name, Nathan. Um, you talked about Winooski and this space with a lot of stairs, and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if all of our buildings were just designed so that no matter what your ableism level, n nothing was a barrier, and that everybody else was just existing in a space like that. But that was me, not us. So maybe you can just, if you just say it like this, then it could be us. Okay. Just say you agree. All right. <laughs> so just to begin, we discussed a number of different things. One word that came up um, as we were thinking about what should the building say, and that word was welcome, which we, yeah. we've heard that before. Um, and that kind of captured a few different examples of things we were discussing really pertaining to the value of equity um, in our district and in our facilities. Um, and we had a few different examples of that. Of course, I think we mean equity in all the ways you can mean it in terms of kind of identity, um, kind of class economic. Um, Nathan, you brought up ability um, as a, an important equity issue as well. Um, again, some specific examples um, talked about uh, the importance of after-school care um, as being an important value, especially as it can be a, such a huge support um, to families who, you know, 
maybe essentially a working family that maybe doesn't have a lot of flexibility in their lives um, and so really need some additional support um, throughout the course of a, a day. Um, we talked about um, equity in terms of the facilities being really accessible to all members of the community um, for events, other kinds of things I think that have come up. Um, and also in that being a multi-generational kind of space um, where we can not segregate people based on age perhaps in the community but look for opportunities for um, multi-generational um, kinds of experiences. Um, talked about equity in terms of kind of really valuing all different dimensions of learning and the child development experience, which I think gets back to another point about um, different learning styles, different modes. Um, so how do our facilities really accommodate those, those different um, ways of being in the world? Um, and then we did touch on, lastly, we did touch on the environmental leadership um, piece really at the end. Um, and I think some things that came up around that were um, important to be kind of um, going towards that goal of net zero, which we've heard perhaps a lot talked about in the district and in the town, um, but also not putting undue burden on the district and on taxpayers in terms of adopting things that are maybe unproven or untested. Mm -hmm. um, so as new technology becomes more mainstream, it becomes more affordable. Um, and we should absolutely be incorporating that. So in, in some sense, that is a kind of a leadership position where your school facilities become um, really a beacon of this is what is possible when we're thinking about environmental sustainability. Um, I'm going to ask you to just uh, drill down on that a little bit more yeah. and in the, within the context of, of saying that um, kind of net zero energy buildings and even net zero carbon is uh, at this point a fully proven and vetted approach, um, which I can't imagine you would find a scenario where it wouldn't pay back in a mm -hmm. financial sense. Mm -hmm. The period of payback depends on the details of how you do yeah. it. But I don't think there's a, I actually think that's probably long-term benefit to taxpayers yeah. specifically. Yeah. So I wouldn't shy away from you know, putting a stake in, I, I would say you know, now's the time to put a stake in. Yeah. As opposed to trying to, the more you try to, to soft pedal or provide, if you provide too much flexibility, it can water down the impact. Mm -hmm. Because we, we just had this discussion the other day about you can say we want it to be uh, sustainable and healthy, but what does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to use non toxic materials that have been vetted through a third party? We're going to uh, achieve a certain level of rigor around the, the, the energy performance of the building. And in order for the for the guiding principles to really have uh, impact and kind of have teeth, mm -hmm. they have to be a little bit more specific than just a platitude. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm encouraging, I guess, here to say, you know, go ahead and say net zero energy or net zero carbon. And if that's something that the community, as assembled here today, believes is important, mm -hmm. then it'll bump up. Yeah, I think I think the the discussion was, you know. Limited resources, lots of priorities, which maybe then aren't priorities. Um, and so how do you make decisions that take in, again, equity within our community? And we talked about taxation and the tax rate um, right. and people's ability to right. really afford tax rates that maybe their income doesn't allow. And so in, in the scope of all those different priorities we have, um, you know, what, where do we start to make decisions about what we can do now versus what we do later? So that, I think that's where the discussion yeah, yeah. was around um, the, the environmental leadership piece. So yeah. add that zero to the list? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, what, one, make it so. One question I had about equity was, what about equity across the buildings? In other words, mm -hmm. take an example, uh, middle school has no performing art space, nothing. This, this has a nice auditorium, so does the elementary school. Does that matter? Does, should, should every age group have the same access to opportunities? Um, or is it okay if the buildings, some buildings have some stuff and don't, other buildings don't have other stuff? So I guess in terms of equity, did that come up in your conversation? Yeah, it didn't. Um, but I can't help thinking of the example in Winooski, and I haven't visited that school, but an all-inclusive facility 
there's an efficiency gain there, I would think, because you can consolidate all the different types of spaces that you might like um, for your academic programs, your enrichment programs. Um, yeah, one kitchen, not three. Yeah, so I, it didn't come up in our discussion, but yeah. it's a great point. I'm also wondering, I mean, I take your point, but if we, I mean, we are a small community and things are pretty close together, yeah. right? And so if we thought about distribution of like key priorities across the schools and then we genuinely shared them as a community space, um, that might include multi-generation and we have like this super vibrant senior community that, um, probably because of COVID, we haven't really been able to welcome into our schools in a really long time. But, um, you know, is it, if we are, like, looking at Main Street Middle, hypothetical, and we're sort of picking, like, what are the things we really, really want to see in that school? And we said, well, we can, we have a performing arts space here that the students can access. We have a performing arts space at Union. Right. What if we invested in, um, being able to team teach, you know, uh, which is part of one of the yeah. goals. No, like, I, so I think there might be, we don't have to say every building has to have the same. No, no, and, and, yeah. and it, it's more about like equity of opportunities for mm -hmm. all students, right? Yeah. And so, and, it, and I just use that as one example. Um, it could be science labs, right? Yeah. It could be like, do the elementary schools have access to, not science labs, but appropriate science um, experience middle school, high school, and looking at, you know, through that lens to make sure that things don't drop off. I mean, we have, there's some districts we work in where like middle school, they have a flight of kids because the middle school offerings are so weak that in middle school, all the kids, a lot, a lot of parents who have choices, uh, who are able to make choices, send their kids to private school. And then maybe they come back for high school, maybe they don't, but, and so we're working on the, uh, in one district on a regional middle school concept because they're, they're just like we're losing so many kids because our programs are so weak because they're not getting the equity of opportunities across ages. Um, so anyway, I just it's something to think about. Um, I don't, you know, this is, this is your workshop, so I, I just want to bring that up. I do want to bring up the, the color thing. It's an interesting example at Winooski because I was talking about some of these things are in multiple categories. Well, the way the color scheme started was they came to us when we were talking about it, they said, we have a lot of kids who are experienced trauma and we need colors that are soothing, that help kids regulate. We don't want a school of crazy, like, you know, reds and these, you know, like, you see, we've all seen schools like that. It's like, you know, the Crayola box got uh, unleashed, you know. And so we did this research and we found a white paper that talked about um, that colors of nature are very regulating. So at Winooski, it's all blues and greens and grays, the colors of nature. So then we themed each school, um, I think it was uh, forest, river, and mountains. So we, at, we accentuated different color, uh, you know, the, the elementary school was more playful, it was more green because it was the forest. Middle school was the river, so it was more, more blues because it's a transitional. And then um, high school was the mountain because it was, you know, you're at the top and it was a darker, more adult color. So it both had a wellness component and an engagement. Probably, came out of there, kind of just to circle back to what we're doing today, it came out of their guiding principles. Yeah. One of the things they said was, we need a space that promotes calmness and tranquility to enable student readiness to learn. Because right. they have literally 30% of their kids refugees coming from refugee camps. That's, that's a, it's a great point. So just connecting it back to, we're going to come up with these guiding principles. They, they can be very powerful in helping guide the design and uh, of the master plan and, and potentially future building projects. So we're going to, get, we're going to do one last... Uh, element of the whole child framework, which is learning. And this is really, you know, about some people, you probably have heard the term 21st century learning, you know. This is the idea that about student-centered learning, um, 
whereas the old model, you know, they call it the, the sage on the stage, right? That um, this is more about the guide at, by your side, right? So in the old model, this is very crude, but students were empty vessels in which teachers poured knowledge into. And um, in the new model, students are active, uh, actively creating their learning by through hands-on projects, through um, all kinds of modes. And one of the things about 21st century learning is this idea, and we touched about it before, is that every student, not, not every student is different, but there are multiple um, paths, pathways for learning. Um, some kids can sit and listen to a lecture. Other kids need to read uh, the material. Other kids need to do hands-on learning. Um, and we need to provide all these different pathways so that kids can be successful in their own way. Um, so we just talked about equity, um, about equal access opportunities for all, um, consistency of delivery and messaging, um, and this idea of depth versus breadth, you know, uh, across, across the system. Um, the richness of offerings, um, not just classes, but also extracurriculars or co-curriculars, sports. Um, you know, in some schools where they're talking about consolidation, um, you know, one of the main things is like, can you offer world language? Can you offer um, chess club? Is there somebody, is there enough kids to form? Um, so the size of the school, and this is why I was saying like the micro schools that we have, a lot of them in Vermont here, if you talk to educators, no, nobody's like saying like, these are the greatest things because they're a struggle to staff, they're expensive, um, and you don't have enough critical mass of either teachers or students to offer this rich variety. Um, so now we're just talking about some of the different um, way, ta talking about different aspects of 21st century learning. So one is team-based, and this goes back to the engagement, the idea of creating a sense of community. This is a middle school team space at Winooski. And um, what it is is there's a central common area and then all the classrooms surround it. Um, and so they have morning meeting here, they have small group work, um, they, they have one-on-one -on -one counseling. There's actually these corner rooms here, these small focus rooms on either side of the space where uh, for service delivery, so special ed, speech and language, um, so that um, the support staff can deliver services in the team space without having to move the kids. Um, this is the space I think Jill was talking about. Uh, this is the high school at Winooski. This is a this is an existing 1956, 57 building. Just very similar. Very similar. Um, we removed. So what happened was we built a new middle school, um, which allowed us to take out some classrooms. So we took out four classrooms, one, two, and then upstairs three and four. And we were able to create this dynamic um, learning center. And, um, and I call it that because even though it's a social space, you know, learning happens everywhere now. We're not confined to a classroom. You have your laptop, you're doing group work. Um, and it's not just the students who use this space. Half the time we go there, we see that there's staff, there's adults sitting on the, on the steps or in these comfy chairs collaborating. Because one of the key features, it's probably a slide coming up, is collaboration is um, a, a huge part of 21st century learning. And to do that, you have to have spaces that allow people to gather. And here we go, right on cue. Collaboration. Um, and part of it is physical, but part of it is Schedule-wise, is there a common planning time in the school? Um, this is a East Montpelier. This is a, a, a read-aloud nook in their library that we designed. Um, you know, 
in an existing building, you know, you, there are ways you can create these kind of teaming spaces, but even just putting connecting doors between the classrooms allows teachers to easily, and students go between classrooms um, and starts to build that collaboration. Because, you know, one of the things, you know, going back to engagement and getting kids engaged um, is, and you'll see this coming up, is this interdisciplinary learning. So uh, we were working with one school. They had a whole unit on light. So the English teachers, language arts was talking about the poetry of light. Physics was talking about the physics of light. Um, they, 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 they did it completely across all of the core subjects and including art. And art uh, was able to um, talk about how the effect of light on, you know, with shadow and, and so, and that's, that can be very exciting and that, that can be very meaningful. Um, some schools are creating theme-based academies. So um, you could have a performing arts academy within your school. So you create a collection of classes and focus that really focuses on the performing arts. You could have a STEM um, academy. There, you know, all these are different ways to try and engage um, learners. You know, I used to be um, of the mind that, you know, we should give everybody a little bit of everything, right? It's like a Whitman sampler. Just try a little bit of everything and then eventually you'll find out what you like. And I, I've really, there's been a sea change, at least this is just me now talking, my personal thinking, because what I've seen is that when kids go deep and, and get really immersed and passionate about something, um, they can learn, they, you know, first of all, they're engaged, but that's a transferable skill. Having a relationship with a subject or a sport or an instrument, having and getting to that level of mastery is a transferable skill that you can take with you in life. And so I, I think some of these, this idea of theming a school, a different curriculum in the school to create tracks for kids um, could help with that. Um, Project-based learning is also another way to get kids engaged. Um, this is a, a, a maker space at the Faston Elementary School. Here we, we did break out the Crayola box, as you can see. Um, <laughs> The, um, but these hands-on learning experiences, you know, um, it was Howard Gardner who really broke open this idea and he identified all these different learner profiles and that's what really started this, this whole 21st century learning and, and the idea that people learn in best in different ways and for some kids it's hands-on learning. Another, another thing is the group work where, you know, what we see, uh, how many times have you walked down the hall of a high school or middle school and see kids working in the hallway, sitting on the floor, right? We think we've all seen that. And that's because there's, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on group work because guess what? That's, that's how we all work in, in, in the work world, right? You've got to learn how to work with other people and collaborate. And so what happens is a teacher will say, okay, we've got 20 kids, we're gonna have five groups of four, and we're gonna break into groups. Well, guess what, have you ever had five groups of four in your classroom? So it's like, well, okay, you go to the library, you go in the hallway. There's, there's literally no places in the schools for this kind of activity. Um, and so 21st century learning uh, incorporated into design provides those kind of spaces. Do you need more space? Do you need to put more building on more space to find that space, or do you go up? Oh, well. You know, one to two story, I mean, it's, it's six and one half a dozen the other. It depends on the site. It depends on it's, the site, depends on what your priorities are. I mean, that's a diff, that's like a, that's a different question. It's, 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 it's what, an interesting one, but maybe not. A lot not of our schools, though, are certainly adequate Yeah. yeah. Like they used to house 500, they now have 200. Yeah. But there's no space for group learning, there's no space for the counselor, there's no space for the therapist. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I, generally, you know, there's enough classroom space in, in schools these days. It's just all these other spaces. And, you know, my wife's a school-based clinician, or was, and, you know, she's been in copy rooms, she's been in gymnasium <laughs> closets, she's been, it's just unbelievable. I, every once in a while she calls me in and I'm like, you have no ventilation. One time she was in a closet with a copier with no ventilation in the room and I, we, we had to get her out of there. And, you know, I was happy to be the bad guy in those situations. Um, individualized learning is another component. So this idea that, you know, everybody learns differently and giving choice, student choice, student voice um, to, to what they want to learn as long as it meets the rubric of expectations. Learning community, um, a lot of schools have programs where kids learn in the community, which is very powerful. So here are the, the prompts. Um, what are the important elements of the approach to learning in, this, in the school district? And how can the facilities best support those? And some of the things we talked about are listed here. I won't read all of them. So we'll give you folks 10 more minutes, and then we're going to get to the, um, the fun part. Uh, we're going to give out dots. And we're, after we report out, we're going to do a little dotocracy um, and see what's really important. So um, we'll come back together in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and uh, see what you have to say. I heard a lot of choice, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds like that's a theme mm -hmm. based on the example. So with choice goes richness of opportunities, right? You can't, you can't have choice if you don't have the resources to provide the opportunities. Yeah, so I, I was going back and forth, and I kind of chuckled a little bit. My kiddo went to a Montessori school, and a lot of the terminology he was using is Montessori based mm -hmm. where you allow choice but you allow you encourage the kids to go deeper so it's a little bit for me it was yes and mm -hmm. allowing choice and the opportunity to go deeper so you were thinking I see that's funny because I just came at it from the opposite direction mm -hmm. we, we yeah. got there yeah. so <laughs> you were thinking of it as choices that individual kids can make and I was thinking of it as a variety of learning choices <laughs> oh, yeah. available and then like in the middle is kids having really rich, rich. academic experiences that. Yeah. yeah, we got there. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say another important element is collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, our teachers are already doing a lot of that, yeah. and it's something that we want to make sure to our buildings can support, can support yeah. and foster. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, going to the project-based learning thing, like, um, I just wonder, you know, I think about, like, where does, where does innovation, where is innovation going to come from? Because it's not going to be someone toiling away or a group of, like, single subject people. It's not going to be just engineers working on one thing. It's going to be the engineer and the economist and the, you know, the um, the business person working so like if if there are opportunities for multiple disciplines to come together around a around a project so it's not just collaboration for the teachers it's collaration both students yeah. interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary yeah interdisciplinary interdisciplinary yeah yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah those are good distinctions really like that idea of that was really cool. yeah that was seemed neat um, I've got a facility kind of yeah when they talked about theater here and theater there, but not at that yeah. school, I thought about the same thing from a sports standpoint. And so I think, you know, maybe the umbrella for that is just safe, modern facilities that allow for that richness of opportunities, whether it's theater, whether it's sports, whether it's clubs. That they just It's not like you're going into an asbestos-laden, poorly lit space to do your theater. Um, the tracks are sports example yeah. of that. It's it's not a safe facility. Um, oh, the, I see. What you're and this so almost goes back to our like our engagement thing where we talked about how the spaces should serve the outcomes right. that you're looking for. Right. right. So if uh -huh. it's whether it's extra, extracurriculars, right? So, right. Um, 
yes. athletics or, or performing arts or whatever it is, or it's like, you know, like if you said to the librarian at the school, what are the actual curriculum goals that you're trying to achieve? And you said, are you, are you just piecing that together in this space? Like what we do? Right, right, to right, start right. How right. Would you Right. Yeah, because social emotional learning seems to be this huge area where we did have loss during COVID, and we want that to have we can identify. gain. Right. right. Yeah. And so, if we know that all these other things, I remember the principal speaking, the high school principal, at one of the many meetings about how if you have extracurricular things and you've got this richness, and so people can find their tribe and everything, yeah. you will have. Uh, uh, you know, an increase in that social emotional learning because they fell in love with theater, they fell in love with ultimate frisbee, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But if you only have one offering, it's like, sorry, if you're not in a chess club, that's all we have. Yeah. That's that's not ideal. Right. Or this or things like projects like the Solar Decathlon, which is more of a college level thing, but you you and you get all these different groups together to build a house that can be off the grid. And right. Yeah. Have, have like a, a built something at the end of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, something I was thinking about that was a little little bit different is is um, you know the in learning in terms of hand you know both a a little contradictory but like the hands on stuff you know like well to support support kids in any kind of career like there's going to be kids here that are academics that are like you know business they're going to be entrepreneurs there's people going to go out into the trades mm -hmm. right away mm -hmm. from here like how. I don't, I don't have an answer to this, but how well, do you support all of that? Okay, so mm -hmm. I think one thing that you're pointing at... It's an element, right? It's an answer to that first one. Having hands-on yeah. learning. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And then also, Dave and I were talking about this before the meeting. In Montpelier Roxbury, we don't have a CTE center, but on the state level, we need to address our CTE centers because right. they're like 50 years old, right? Mm. So how do you go from um, having cool hands-on learning and maker spaces in like you know elementary middle school and then how do we have like really awesome robust CTE centers that our high school kids can access right can plug into, into the trade, yeah. engineers or whatever there's aerospace engineering too the yeah. Arlington one is my understanding yeah yeah yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. which it, you know that that serves the needs of the businesses in that community it right, does and too. they did a, a private public partnership to help mm -hmm. pay for Gotcha. getting that facility to be able to support Got it. Right. aviation, right? right. Like, mm. so, yeah, and I think, but that also goes back to our idea of like communities, the schools, schools, the community that includes yeah. business community. Yep. Like, yep. We shouldn't not include that because they create really exciting opportunities for our kids. But where are they going to do it? Is it in like the 50 year old city attached to Spalding? You know, right. like an right. automotive, but right. first cars that were built 60 years ago, right. you know, like, well, how do we integrate yeah. technology? I don't know if that's a problem for so, SP, but... But the facilities <laughs> somehow support that richness of offerings we want them to have, and then they've got the choice. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But it's easy to see how our facilities especially if we deferred a lot of maintenance on things, if we, you know, it's easy to see how they wouldn't offer up a lot of richness. And there's examples that I can think of just outside that that's an issue. And um, so I, I see that there's probably other things that I'm not even aware of where it's limiting. I don't know. I know that the, the kids uh, that are in theater in middle school are coming over to the high school. Um, and because we've got that walkability, it facilitates mm, right. it. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of my point. Is like, if, mm -hmm. if you ask me, I mean, you yeah, yeah. Different, different things there, and they're sort of what you might call traditional art classes. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting to think of artist, chef, you know, yeah. in residence, right? Exactly. More, um, yeah, people who are sort of like showcasing more sort of like alternative, you yeah. know, or just like, yeah, just. And just obviously that's a way to learn too. It's like, oh, you know, cooking is, you can learn science, you can learn math. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, same thing with, I mean, obviously there's, you know, Montpelier Alfie has a relationship with the Barry Tech Center too for other more sort of hands on things. Yeah, the, which is now called uh, <coughs> Center for Montpelier Center. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, which I think, yeah, is, is, is a good rebrand. Yeah, and so I'm just back to the, you're saying we need help reconfiguring the building mm -hmm. to make other learning styles possible. I'm not sure that all these things, I mean, 
maybe those can all be accomplished. I also am not sure you get away with not having a science lab. Yeah. Right. So I don't. I think there's some. There's some. It's sort of both ends. Um, and I don't know how. You know, I I just come back to what you said. It'd be great to have teachers here. What is the literature teacher? Do they wish for? I don't need a room with my bookshelves here in this configuration. Do they? You know, could they teach in the auditorium? You know, could, it could be. Yeah, I don't know. Or does the English teacher want to go sit like in a sort of cafe vibe place and mm-hmm. you know comfortable chairs and yeah you know well we have teach just, that way just out here there's this courtyard yeah that's a that's a really sort of semi private kind of beautiful outdoor yeah. space where they do some community events they have like a you know like a uh, pizza anyway they have they have some really wonderful things that happen for the high school. And it's feels a courtyard great. through these doors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I have no idea. And there's the a tree and some green. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's yeah you terrific. thirty-two has yeah. one. I yeah. know because my kids went there. Yeah. And so it's, um, you know, to your point about <laughs> on a nice day, can you go out and teach a class out there? Mm-hmm. Great. Obviously, that's not a four season thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if it was roofed over, it was. Yeah, but then you lose the. Yeah. Then you lose the. The beauty of the spring day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately it just comes down to, like, making sure that the, the facilities have the spaces, indoor, outdoor, that can support the sort of, like, software of multiple different, mm-hmm. you know, pathways of learning. Mm-hmm. You know, we have some of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit caught because I don't know. I'm not teaching actively in the schools, yeah. so I don't know. Like what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. You know, I mean, part of me, like even just being in this library, I'm like, I feel like there should be a lot more books. <laughs> Maybe so. Right. <laughs> or should there be true. tablets and computer terminals? Yeah. Right, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Many, mo- many contemporary libraries are Converted. incredibly multimedia. Yeah. And I'm not sure this is that. Do we have some right now? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Last but not least. Last but not least. Uh, so, I'm not sure we were as productive on this one. I think, just speaking for myself, the uh, I think your preceding slides were intended to prime us. It would be great if there, to me, if there were. Anyway, uh, so what you've presented there is sort of here's what's on the menu of how learning happens now, and I I think the one wish that was strongest in this group was we wish there were more teachers in the room right now. Um, I'm not a teacher in the schools right now. I don't have a burning. I don't have a, a top five list of things that I really wish I could do differently and that I'm constrained by the space. Yep. So uh, I hope that that's incorporated into this process. Um, you know, I, I think um, Lynn said it best, you know, we need help reconfiguring the buildings uh, to make more learning styles possible. and. I'm not sure it's. I'm not sure we had clarity on what that was. We liked some of the ideas of multi-generational mixing organically. Some of what you described in the sort of atomized Winooski space that now is a large open space. Um, one idea was bringing the community into the school. You know, can you have? Can we have artists in residence or a chef in residence or you know, sort of integrated learning in that way? And then another idea was really doubling down on the community-based learning that already does happen, which is individualized and we sort of are outside the box where students are learning in the community and and we're not as reliant on the structure of this building or another building. Um, Some discussion about the holistic aspect of mental health and healthy ways of living. Uh, Am I missing anything? No, I think we got a little bit off track outside of the actual building aspect, but uh, <laughs> we sort of veered off track a little bit from the, the facilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think 
we highlighted a few of these bullets on the right that seemed really important to, to our group. Um, so we talked about the importance of team-based teaching to create that kind of professional learning community for educators, um, creating those kind of smaller support systems for teachers, aligning them around what they're doing in their, their respective classes, um, also space for collaboration and you know, kind of getting feedback, bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So, yes, team-based teaching, good. That's yep. support systems for teachers. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> collaboration. collaboration. And alignment was a word that we used. Alignment, alignment of strategies. strategies. Strategies and approaches. Yeah. Like learning, learning education strategies. Yeah. 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 Sorry, there's a No, it's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got the good smelly ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, talked about um, the importance of community-based learning, um, which can give students kind of a more real-world view into how what they're doing applies in a number of different kind of professional um, situations, careers. Um, I think related to that was um, project-based learning as kind of giving students something really meaningful to like dig into, um, a sense of accomplishment, kind of seeing something from start to finish. Um, and again, I think it's another application of kind of hands-on learning. talked about um, being able, this gets back to the kind of differences of learning styles or those kind of gardener's intelligences. Um, you know, having content presented in a lot of different media, different formats to accommodate different learning styles, um, whether you're maybe a more visual learner or a more textual learner or maybe a more kinesthetic learner, um, just having those kinds of options um, really accessible. And then just to sum up like how our facilities um, could help support these approaches, and I think this has come up in previous conversations, but just flexibility within our spaces to accommodate all these different learning styles, all these different approaches to education. Um, collaboration, project-based learning, um, particularly the idea of being able to bring together many different disciplines to work on a project together, and hands-on learning. We've got hands-on, project-based, collaboration. Something that started with a P that didn't catch. Oh, project-based. Project okay. Oh, yeah, the project base and the multidisciplinary sort of went together, but could be separated. And then we'd be looking to the facilities to be able to have spaces that serve the outcomes we're going for and also celebrate the endeavor. So um, the example that was said here was like, let's say we had an auditorium in the middle school, but that it was like, super teeny tiny or dark or like laden with asbestos, would that actually be celebrating the arts <laughs> in any way, shape, or form? Cave and sing. Right. Um, so not just that there just are... Just to be clear, we would not put children in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, noted on the record. Wasn't my idea. <laughs> wasn't my example. I'm just... I'm the it was my elementary school experience. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, 
as and that included. that yeah. that the spaces yeah. offer a, a richness of both educational and ed extracurricular offerings, and then that the spaces can support our staff in the work that they want to and need to be doing together. Richness of educational and extracurricular offerings. If can I make a note too, just because it's come up a couple of times in yeah. the conversation I had this morning around learning and food. Um, I don't know if we've connected with Food Connects before. It's a regional organization in Southern Vermont, New Hampshire. Just might be a plug to connect with them related to food, farming, learning in particular. Mm -hmm. They help kind of create farm to school and food based learning programs. Food Connects. And it kind of touches on a number of the things that have come up. Sorry, that's an aside, but yeah, yeah. we didn't so talk I'm about it as a group, but duly noted. I just yeah. wanted to name it. He's going it. rogue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did go rogue a little yeah. bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> He's not following the rules. Nope. It's no. very no. inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I did make an individual joke. <laughs> Anything else from that group? Or? Nope. That's everything. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to put these... Do we have a place to hang them, or do we just put them on the tables? Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to ask is nine dots and um, three different colors. So um, what colors do we have? Red, green, and blue? Yellow. Yellow. Red, green, and yellow. Yeah, red is learning. Red and green. So, put, so do red for learning green for engagement, and yellow on the wellness one. So what we're asking people to do is to vote for their top three in each category of what what's really the most important top three. So I'm going to put so these. Is learning, what word there is. Green is, okay. So the only one that they, the ma they match color. up with the letters. They match up with the. They match up with these except use yellow on the blue one. Because we didn't have. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. This is the end of our session. We really appreciate all of your input um, and have a safe drive home. Any, has anyone not had dots? Oh, wow. That's really not great to rule. Right. Oh my, choices. <laughs> Just so everyone feels empowered to do this too, it's not like any of these concepts go away. But what this what this helps us because because we care about all these things, all these things are in parts of our presentation. What this is going to help us do is it's going to help us focus guiding principles for the project so that the most important things don't get left behind at some point in the future. So that, and I'll give you an example, as people are thinking and talking, I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> on another project we had a, a very specific guiding principle that said, all occupied spaces shall have natural light, either directly or from a, an adjacent space. And, and at, at, at some point in the project, there was a budget shortfall, and we had to decide what was going to stay and what was going to go. And the, and the superintendent said, we cannot violate these guiding principles, so we have to keep, among other things, natural light in every occupied space. So it was a way for us down the road to remember, and for all of us on the project team, administrators, teachers, architects, to hold each other accountable for what was most important to the community.
Yeah, I think you, yeah. I've been, your name is, I ran by your house the other day, yeah, yeah. and then twice, and then I, and I was thinking about you, and I was like, okay, i got to pick that thread up, because yeah, I yeah. signed up for that uh, one session, yeah. and then couldn't make it, yeah. okay. I want to go back and watch the tape or whatever, okay. and, and I literally just... Yeah, no, no, no. I'd love, yeah, I'd love to grab coffee. It's been kind of a we recently moved so I've been oh, focused. Away from J Street? No, to, to J Street. We've been painting and doing all the things, and now 